Okay, so yeah, so um, let's just review some knowledge to begin with, um, uh, stuff that, um, that I think you, you, you should know. Um, uh, so first off is a bounded convergence theorem. Bounded convergence theorem. Can somebody tell me the bounded convergence theorem? And it doesn't matter if you, if you don't know. Have you seen the bounded convergence theorem? Yes. Okay, so here's, here's the idea, right? You have some, um, you have uh, a bunch of functions, right? You have a sequence of functions, right? S of n, right? And you have, for all of these functions, you have some bound, right? right? There's, some, there's some upper and lower bound, right? And, and then what? What's the rest of it? Under these conditions, if something happens, then something else happens. Just to I'm, I'm, just to bring you all out of your Christmas Christmas stupor. Does anyone remember? What what are the convergence things about? What are they about? Switching. Switching, yeah. Mm -hmm. Switching switching limit and integration. Right. When can you when, when can you switch the order? When is basically right, the limit of the f of n as n is infinity equal to the integral of the limit? So and this will be some, some function, right? So the, the um, <clears throat> so the statement is if um, if you if these guys are bounded and the limit at every point is if the if there's a pointwise limit to uh, pointwise convergence to some function, um, then you can you can change the order of integration. You can you can then these things commute. So this is the bounded convergence theorem, and all all the convergence theorems are sort of sort of along this along these lines. Right? Under certain conditions, um, if you have a certain sort of sort of if you have a certain sort of convergence, um, then then these things commute. You can you can change the order. Um, you know the, the limit of the integrals actually does equal the integral of the limit the, the integral of the limit function. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe I might. Do all of these things, but um, one of them is written down. Let me just do three, three or four things to review. Monotone is written down. Okay. Um, so uh, again, you're going to have, of course, you know, some sequence of functions. I mean, you have some sequence of functions, right? And does anyone remember? Does anyone remember the conditions? It's monotone convergence. Right? You can sort of guess what the what's going to happen if you have a if you have any guess. Yes. Yeah. So typically, what it uses says increasing. Right? If you have if um, this is an increasing um, uh, if this is an increasing sequence. Of, of non negative functions, non negative measurable, measurable functions, um, and you have and you have um, uh, right, you have the um, again, you have a point wise limit on the starting plan. Um, then again you can commute, right? Um, the the limit, the integral of the of the limiting function um, actually equals the limit of the integrals. Right? So when, when can you commute limit and integration? Okay. Does can anyone give an example of a case where you cannot commute a limit and integration? What goes wrong, right? Uh, what goes wrong? Uh, when give, just give a sequence that you know commutes pointwise to some function, but the the limit of the integrals is not the integral of the limit. I just have uh, What's your name? Brian. Brian. Yes. Um, n times the characteristic function, or one over n times the characteristic function from zero to n. Interval. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So the integral is always one. Right? The integral 
Like you, you're looking at these guys that spread out, right? These guys that spread out. Well, the limit is zero, but the integral is always one. Right? The limit function, point-wise, the limit function is, um, you know, the limit is zero at every point. Right? So here's your um, f1, here's f2, here's f3, f4. Right? And at every point, well, f, f n of x is going down to, going down to zero. Um, so the integral of the limit is zero, but the uh, limit of the integrals is one, right? because the integral of each guy is one. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's, um, you know, uh, uh, that's typically how one explains it. Um, you, know, you could also have you know, something like a block that moves, moves to the right, right? A block that, um, so s of n being the same, the characteristic function of n, and plus one. So, okay. so right, at every point, the limit is zero, and the integral is one. Right? So um, it, it moves. It, it moves to. It keeps on walking. It moves to infinity. Okay. The support moves to infinity. Okay. So. Okay. Um, okay. So last one. Uh, dominated convergence theorem. Last. Convergence theorems. The dominated convergence. Can anyone say this one? Does anyone remember this one? If you don't, it's okay. You know, you just come back from from partying and I don't know if you're drinking or you're doing like carousing. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Sequence of measurable functions. Yes. Yes. Like before, and then. Um, you have an L1 function, yeah. and the absolute value of each of the measurable functions is dominated yeah. by the L1 function. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And then like, the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, so you have some L1 function, right? You have some L1 function, um, uh, G. Okay. So it's an integrable function, right? And what you have is that um, you have a bunch of other functions, uh, S of n. Right, that um, so you have, you have a bunch of other functions s of n, right, and they're all all these guys at every point dominated by by this guy. Okay, so they live inside of this lemma. Okay, this is how it was explained to me when I was in undergrad. Okay, you got you have this, this function, you got all these functions, and as long as they live inside this lemma. Right? right, because that's what an L1 function is going to look like. Right, it's going to it has to have some decay. Right, um, right. So you have a sequence of measurable functions, and you have G, which is integrable. Right, G integrable function. Right, and um, uh, then as usual, right, if the functions, if the sequence converges pointwise to some function. Then you have um, that the integral of the limiting function is the limit of the uh, of the integrals. So these are the uh, three uh, sort of three. Well, I mean, this is really the big theorem of, uh, of, um, of the big the big convergence there. And in the notes, um, I've also included a sort of generalized. Generalized dominated convergence there, so take a look. Okay, everyone all right? Okay, so we're just we're just reviewing, you know, when you can interchange um, limit and integral, right? Um, and you know, the problem is that um, you know you could have these guys that these supports move off towards infinity, but you see that that won't work, you know, if if you have this rule of eleven. Then you know those guys don't satisfy that. Right? That's that's because they, they leave they leave the they not they leave the line. Okay. So. okay. Okay. So a um, couple of other things that will uh, become needed uh, shortly. Um, so um, the notion of um, uh, so absolutely continuous measure. So um, you have x. Uh, Measurable space. Space, and you have these two measures, uh, 
mu and nu uh, measures defined on the you know, on the set of uh, measurable function measurable uh, sets. So this is the space, right? This is the space, and this is the um, sigma algebra of measurable sets. Right? And you've got these two measures defined on defined on this. Uh, on this. Okay. Um, this notion of absolute of one measure being absolutely continuous with respect to the other. Um, so uh, if whenever If whenever um, the measure of the set A is zero, one has that the new new measure of A is also zero. We say that new is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. So absolutely. So yeah, this notation is the measure, like A is, A is some, one of those measurable sets, right? You're taking the measure, whenever the measure of a set is zero uh, with respect to the new, mu measure, the measure of that set is zero with respect to the new measure. Okay. Then we say that mu is absolutely continuous with respect to, with respect to mu. Okay. Um, the main thing uh, that will, the main result we use uh, with that definition is the so-called random negative error. Okay. So, uh, so you have um, x, f, and mu, a single finite negative space. Okay. And you remember that sigma, sigma finite means that um, you can have this collection of sets um, such that their union is the whole space, um, and each one has finite measure. Each one has mu finite measure. Okay, so it just means that um, mu. Uh, it just means that x is a union, is a countable union of uh, sets which each have finite measure. Okay, so you have a sigma, sigma finite um, measure space, um, and you have mu. A um, measure on f, another measure on f. Um, if nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, then then something good happens. Um, does anyone does anyone know what that good thing is? It's okay if you don't run. There exists a function such that one measure is uh, the integral of the function with respect to that measure. Right, right, right. So there exists there's, there's some sort of like density function. Um, uh, and that function is called the random negative derivative. So um, if you have absolute continuity, then there exists um, a non negative measurable function um, f. Called the radon negative derivative on um, the derivative of new with respect to new, um, such that for all sets, for all measurable sets, um, the new measure of e is the integral of this function against the new measure uh, over that set. Okay, and you can see that right if right if if mu you know, if mu is zero on that set, then of course mu is going to be zero on that set. Right? If 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 the measure of if the measure of E in the mu measure is zero, well, then this integral is zero. Right? This integral is zero, and so mu is going to be zero. So that that clearly forces the um, 
the, the measure new to be absolutely continuous. And in fact, this is the only this is this is what always happens. Okay, then um, any any such uh, any absolutely continuous measure is realized in this way, can be realized in this way. Don't worry if, if you've forgotten these things or um, if you've forgotten, you know, I'll, I'll bring up uh, basically any sort of uh, relevant knowledge that we need um, when, we, when we see it. Okay, so now let's, let's really get started. Um, well, we're going from review stuff to sort of basic stuff. Um, but, uh, so let's, um, so we're not really, I'm, I'm sorry, let me take that back. We're not really getting started yet. Um, um, but, so now let's get into some basic questions. Okay. Um, so, First thing we're going to get to is the important notion of bottom cases. Okay, so just you know, and you may sort of feel embarrassed, or I feel I feel a little embarrassed for this this definition, but I'm going to put it up anyway. So um, it being a uh, vector space over um, R. Uh, 
right? And um, right, so you have a, you have this metric, right? Once you have a metric, you also have, say, for example, a notion of open sets, right? You have the notion of of, of open disks, you know, open balls in space, when right? you have open sets, interior points, when right? you have all the notions of, of topology, right? Once you, as long as you have a norm. Now, it's not the case, um, it, it may be the case, uh, we're not really going to emphasize this. Rudin does more of this, but um, Rudin talks more about the cases when you don't have a norm, right? and yet you have a topology also, and you want to talk about convergence and, and this sort of thing. So we may, we may talk about that as well. But uh, at least not, not for now, we're not going to. So in that case, um, in this, uh, you have these things called semi norms, and you can do some top up topology from the family of semi norms. But anyway, at least for now, uh, it's straightforward. You have a norm, the norm uses the metric, the metric you use to, to create the topology. Okay. okay. Um, right, so in particular, you have the notion of Cauchy sequence. Right? And once you have the notion of Cauchy sequence, you can talk about completeness. Right? And that brings us to the definition. Right? Um, uh, right? um, if the You don't have to be familiar with this. I'm actually going to talk a lot about it. But are, have you, I just want to know, have you seen it before? Close your eyes for a second. Okay. Close your eyes for a second. Lift up the finger if you've seen LP spaces before. OK. Uh, put your fingers down. OK. OK, great. OK, so some of you have and some of you have. That's fine. Um, in fact, you know, those of you who haven't seen it are, are in the right place because I'm going to talk about it quite a lot. Um, in the next day or so. Okay, so LP spaces, um, somebody want to tell me what, what they are? I'm going to have, uh, this will be, for now, it will be a P between 0 and infinity. What's the LP space? What's an LP space? It's a simple definition. Are you shy? Eric, tell me what an LP space is. It's the space of all functions uh, whose, you take the integral and you raise the function of that P power. And it converges. Exactly, exactly. So you define this thing. Um, so this uh, LP is the set of all functions, all measurable functions, um, um, say complex value, um, uh, such that um, the integral of the absolute value of f to the p. Um, everything raised to whatever p is fine. Okay. So of course you don't need this whatever p, right? Right. If 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 that's if this is finite, then certainly this thing to the whatever p is finite. Okay. Um, the reason I put that in is because 
we use that to, to find what's called the LP, LP norm of the function. So it's a set of all functions for which the LP norm is finite. Okay. Such that the LP norm is this function. Okay. Okay. And you know, of course, you put this thing, you put the one over one over p in to make sure that you satisfy property two of the norms. Because otherwise, when you scale the function, right, when you scale the function, you'd be multiplying by you'd be multiplying by a epsilon of a to the p. Right? So you need to you need to take the square root, take the p root of that to to compensate. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So this thing is 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 LP space, right? Um, space. Space LP is a set of all functions uh, such that this integral is, is finite. Um, okay. um, right. So, for example, in a simple example, if x is the natural numbers, say, right, so suppose we're looking at uh, sequences, right? If x is the natural numbers, right, and mu is, say, counting measure. Then uh, you have some sequence, right? Um, a sub n, right? You have some sequence a sub n, uh, and you have some sequence, and you say that that guy is in LP, right? This thing is in LP. Um, if uh, if the sum of the uh, p powers if powers in the bottom line are, are just fine. Right? Right? And, you've, right? Okay. Um, and uh, actually, this is normally called little LP. People call this little, little LP. Okay, okay so um, uh, we, we already noticed that the second property of norms is satisfied because we, we make it we make it true by putting this one over p. Um, what about the first property? Is it true that when you integrate a function, um, I'm sorry, is it true that the LP norm of the function is zero if and only if the function is the zero function? Is that true? Almost almost. Right, so you need almost everywhere. Okay, so it's not true. <laughs> okay, so this is actually not a norm. Okay, this is actually not a norm. Um, right, because you can have you can have a function that is zero everywhere except for some except, except for some points. Right, so that function is not the zero function. Right, but its norm is zero. Its LP norm is zero. Okay, so um, so um, one um, uh, we can't. Uh, I really call it norm. Because uh, right, you could have functions, can have functions. You could have f, which is equal to zero almost everywhere, and then the um, then the LP norm is, is zero. Right? Then the LP norm is zero. Okay, so you know what you do to, to compensate for that is Instead of considering the, the class of functions, you consider the class of, equi of equi you consider the set of equivalence classes. Right? You introduce an equivalence relation on the, on the functions by saying, "I'm going to consider functions to be equal to each other, to be equivalent to each other, as long as they differ on sets of measure zero." Okay. Right? And in that case, you and then you you know you mod out by that relation, and then in that case. A function that's equal to zero almost everywhere is the zero function. Right? Its equivalence class is the zero, is the equivalence class of zero. So you just you just mod out by this relation, and then 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 the first property is true. Okay. So basically, you um, just you sort of finagle it, and you say, well, really we're going to consider functions to be equal as long as they differ on sets of measure zero. Okay. Okay. 
and that's, that's how you ensure that the first property is true. So really, you're not looking at functions. Uh, you're not looking at functions, but you're looking at equivalence classes of functions. Uh, but as, as Stein says, it, in, fact, in practice, it does no harm to just think that we're dealing with functions. So typically, you just think, you just think we're dealing with functions. And occasionally, you may have to remember that you're not really dealing. You're actually dealing with equivalence classes. So, uh, so one, uh, uh, one corrects for this by uh, considering equivalence classes functions uh, that are equal almost every time. Okay. okay. So um, that's 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 one that's one thing that's a little bit problematic. We can't really call this a norm for that reason. Um, uh, and then the second thing, um, do we know that this satisfies the triangle equality? Satisfy the triangle. Does this satisfy the triangle? Um, so, in fact, um, in fact, uh, it's incorrect. Call this one. Uh, in the case uh, p is between zero and one, uh, because then uh, the triangle in quality fails. We, we actually don't know, uh, first off, we don't know that this satisfies the triangle inequality. And in fact, if we look at it, and you will in your homework, you'll see that um, for p between 0 and 1, the triangle inequality fails. Um, uh, and so we'll spend the rest of the class actually proving that the triangle inequality holds for the case p greater than or equal to 1. Okay. So it's wrong to call um, this thing a norm uh, for two reasons. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you have to uh, mod out by this equivalence relation, and second, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you really shouldn't call it a norm um, for p between zero and one. But people do anyway. People sort of sloppily just say p not be norm, uh, even if, uh, and you, you know that it's not right for for uh, p less than one. Okay. 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 These spaces, um, we um, we said that this is actually a, um, an example of like the prototypical example of the Banach spaces. Um, but for right now, we don't even know that it's a norm vector space. We need to show two things: that it's actually a norm vector space, and also that it's a complete norm vector space. Okay. And then we can actually say that this is an example. It's, it's a Banach space. So. Um, Right. Um, to get to show that the triangle inequality is satisfied by this norm uh, for p greater than one, um, we'll need to uh, introduce some uh, some, good, some really useful tools. Um, so uh, we'll introduce some some inequalities that that are sort of like the the, the common tools of people who do analysis. Okay. Um, right, tools and for, for now it will be to show the triangle of inequality, but really, in particular, the first tool we're going to introduce is something that people use all the time, and it's um, uh, Helmer's inequality. And this will be really crucial. Like it's something that really you use like every day of your life. If you're doing if you if you're doing research, then like you just use Helmer's inequality. Like there's no tomorrow. It's like depending on your shoes. It's like shoes. Okay, uh, that I don't know. Maybe that's not. Yeah. But uh, anyway, Helmer's inequality is pretty important. Okay. So um, to uh, to uh, to get to define the, define how the, to state how there's inequality, uh, we need to introduce some notion. Um, so um, uh, first is the notion of conjugate exponents. 
20 decimals. So um, you have some p between 1 and infinity. Uh, we define for p greater than 1 and p less than infinity. So p between, between 1 and infinity. We define um, p prime uh, to be the solution of 1 over p plus 1 over p prime equals 1. That is to say, p prime equals p over p minus 1. Okay. Or that p prime times p minus 1 is equal. But I really want to think about it. Okay. So you know, p prime is the is the is the number that satisfies this. Of course, you see that you know if the dual of p, p is p prime, then the dual of p prime, I'm sorry, this is also called the dual exponent. Um, you see that you know, the, the dual of p prime is p, right? p prime prime is, is of course p. Okay. Um, and for p equals 1, we define p, p prime to be infinity and vice versa. Right, and that sort of makes sense. Right? If you're thinking about this, you know, if p is 1, then you want p prime to be infinity. If p is infinity, you want p prime to be infinity. Okay. So these are the dual, dual exponents. And why they're called dual to each other will become clear uh, when we talk about dual spaces. Okay. Okay, so, um, so here's the theorem of Helmer's inequality. So um, uh, one between p and infinity, and it will actually be true for the for the limit for the end cases as well. So we're just going to state it this way for now, um, because we haven't defined p infinity. Um, okay. um, if f is in L p and g is in L p prime, then in fact the product is in L one. These guys from, from LP spaces of dual dual exponents, then the product is in L1, and in fact, in fact um, uh, the L1 norm is controlled by the product of the LP norm of F against the LP prime norm of G. Once we define L, L infinity. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay. So, um, uh, the, um, the key to this will be, um, the key lemma. The key lemma will be the following. Um, which is, uh, so sort of, if you've read the text, you know that this is sort of a generalized um, arithmetic geometric, arithmetic geometric inequality. Um, so here it is. Um, if A and B are non negative numbers, and theta is some number between 0 and 1. Um, then a to the theta, b to the 1 minus theta is dominated by theta a plus 1 minus theta b. So it's some sort of um, averaging statement, right? Um, if you take theta to be a half, then this says that the product of the square roots is dominated by the average Right, dominated by the, the arithmetic average. Right? The geometric average is dominated by the arithmetic average. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. 
So, so um, so um, So the proof goes like this. Um, uh, so the first thing is that you reduce it, you say, well, without loss of generality, you can assume that B is not zero. Right? Because if, if B is not zero, then you know it's sort of I mean, if B is equal to zero, then it's obviously true, right? Because you get zero on the left hand side. Right? So assume that B is not non-zero. And then you, you do a reduction, okay, and you say, well, actually, um, we notice that. It suffices to show. It suffices to show. Suffices to show that um, for all a greater than equal to zero, that um, a to the theta um, is less than to the theta a plus or minus theta. Okay. So we can reduce this to um, to. We can make this this reduction okay. as long as we. Um, we're in the case B is not equal to zero. Um, all you need to do is show this is true for all for all A. Okay, and the reason is, of course, um, uh, for if we have that, for given that, uh, apply apply it to um, A A over B. Okay. Apply it to A over B. What you get, of course, is um, right, a to the theta b to the negative theta is less than or equal to theta a b minus one plus one minus theta, right? and then you multiply through by b, right? You multiply through by b, and you get the inequality that you wanted. So you know, so all you need to do is, is prove this this simpler statement. Right. And this simple statement is, is proven using calculus. Okay. So to prove something called a star. So for given once you're given a star, you know, that gives you the original, that gives you the original statement. Um, to prove a star, um, just consider the function f of theta um, equals x of theta minus theta x uh, plus one minus theta. And show that show it is less than or equal to zero. Okay. So this is just a calculus problem. Um, it's a it's really a calculus one problem. You take the derivative, you find where its maximum is, is attained. Its maximum is attained at a point where it's zero. Okay. So that's that's it. So this is proved by proven by calculus. And this is the thing 
that we use to get Helmer's inequality. So, everyone, right? Monkey, you don't look a little unhappy. Are you? Is there anything wrong? No. Okay. Everyone, okay? Just to make sure. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. <coughs> Just to make sure. Uh, yeah. Some. Yeah. F of theta equals x to the theta? Yes. Ooh, wait a second. What is that? F of x, sorry. Thank you. Well, f of x? Yeah. x to the theta minus yeah. theta. It's theta x plus 1 minus theta. Okay. Thank you. It was wrong. So um, again, we, we do a reduction. So we, just, we, do, we reduce the problem. We say, well, without loss of generality, we can assume that these things are not zero, that the, that the LP norms, LP and LP prime norms are not zero. Right? Because if they were zero, that would mean that the functions were equal to zero almost everywhere, in which case we'd be asking if zero is equal to zero, which is, of course, true. Because if the LP norm is equal to zero, that means the function is, is zero almost everywhere. Okay. So, um, so uh, in that case, you divide, um, or rather, you replace f by f divided by its LP norm and g divided by its LP prime norm. And you see that this reduces the problem that um, it suffices to show that um, that this is less than equal to one uh, for all functions whose LP norm is, is one and LP prime norm of this kind is equal to one. So you do a reduction. Again, you say, well, look, if it's not equal to 1, then just consider the function that you get by normalizing by its norm, by, by dividing by its norm, and apply this thing to it. Oh, you get the previous, you get the previous thing. Okay. So this is the consequence. Again, this is the consequence of that. Okay. So we just have, all we have to do is show, um, show that this, this is true when the LP norm F is 1 and the LQ norm um, of G is 1. The LQ prime norm is 2, but of G is 1. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. so we will use um, exactly this, this thing to get the pointwise inequality. So we say, well, look, we know that, well, by the lemma, by the lemma, we have that um, F is bounded by um, 1 over p f to p plus 1 over p prime p to p prime. Right? That's, that's what we're saying here. Right. 
and then you just integrate it. Okay. So on the left hand side, what do you get? You get the L1 norm. You get the L1 norm of FG. Right? Integrate on the left side, you get right, the, the L1 norm of, of F times G. And on the right hand side, right, you get 1 over P times, well, you get the LP norm of this thing to the P, P power. Right? You get the LP norm of F to the P power plus 1 over P prime times the LP prime norm to the P prime power. Right? Because you're missing the 1 over P prime. Right? You're missing the 1 over P prime, so you get the norm to the P power. Right? But these are one. Right? These are one, and you get one over p plus one over p prime, which is one. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the proof. Right? That proves the, the reduced statement, and from the reduced statement, you get the full statement that covers there. Covers the equality. Okay. Okay. So. Um, that uh, we still haven't gotten that um, we, we have a norm, right? Our goal right now is to show that um, that the LP norm actually is a norm for P greater than one. We haven't gotten it yet because we, we need to get that the LP norm is a triangle that satisfies the triangle inequality, which is called Minkowski's inequality. We'll use uh, Helder's inequality to get Minkowski's inequality. Okay. And then from there, we'll, we'll um, have a normal vector space, and then we'll show that it's actually a complete normal vector space, um, and then this one should be a box space. Okay. Okay. And then um, we'll do even more uh, more interesting things. Okay. okay, that's it for today. Um, unless there are any questions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah please like, pass over your sheets of information about yourselves to the right and forwards.